But we begin tonight with the utterly dangerous words of an old man that could trigger, trigger World War III. Given the breathless coverage of Robert Hurd's report on not finding crimes to prosecute him for, you would think I was talking about President Joe Biden, but I'm not. I'm talking about Donald Trump. Though given the media's focus these days, I would understand the confusion. So here's the thing. It is the media's responsibility to cover both men with the same dogmatic fervor. But thus far, more ink has been spilled and more hours have been spent dissecting Joe Biden's age and mental fitness than time spent discussing the age and mental fitness of Donald Trump. Case in point, popular information tabulated the coverage of Trump's cognitive issues versus coverage of the Her report. And guess what got little attention? Trump. One network even asked if Biden's age, and I'll remind you, he's just three years older than Trump, is a bigger problem than Trump's indictments for stealing state secrets, lying to the feds about it, and, oh, inciting an insurrection. I guess creating a false equivalency between age and fascism is easier than talking about the latest incoherent fever dreams implanted in the mind of a septuagenarian retiree by his white nationalist aide, Stephen Miller, or maybe his ex-TV doppelganger and fellow Putin fan, Tucker Carlson. So in case you missed it, here's a sampling of Trump's weekend ramblings. Rich people are given $7,000 subsidies. The danger from within is far greater, in my opinion, from the, than the danger on the outside, the fascists, the communists, the serious socialists, I hear that they like Obama better. They should like Obama better. You know why? Because he didn't ask for anything. We have to win in November, or we're not going to have Pennsylvania. They'll change the name. They're going to change the name of Pennsylvania. We can be energy independent, and we can even be energy dominant. And yes, quickly says that President Trump why would they change the name of Pennsylvania, man? Why would they do that? Who to what? Despite this man's clear mental deterioration, that right there is not the most terrifying aspect of what he said this weekend. No, no. What comes next is what should make all of you stop and think real hard about the prospect of this man setting foot in the Oval Office ever again. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, Will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. OK, did you hear that? That was Donald Trump telling his most fervent cult followers that like a below average mob boss, he could invite Vladimir Putin to invade a European country if that country didn't pay up, siding with Russia over our treaty-bound NATO allies. Let's set aside the fact that he probably lied about the story. You know, he always says, sir, when he's making up a story. Let's set aside the fact that Europe actually does pay for its defense. And let's zero in on what is truly deranged and dangerous about what he said, which is his complete betrayal of our allies. The reason that it matters to us is because when we need help, one day when, I don't know, Putin decides to retake Alaska, our allies might think twice about helping us. The comment was so dangerous that Rupert Murdoch's Wall Street Journal compared Trump to UK Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, who is best known for his policy of appeasement of Nazi Germany, as he allowed Hitler to take territory in Czechoslovakia in a failed effort to avoid a Second World War. Allow me to make this crystal clear to everyone watching. What Trump did was invite a third world war in Europe by cheering on more aggression by Russia. In his latest column, Tom Nichols, staff writer for The Atlantic and a former professor of national security, asks why Donald Trump gets a pass for all of the deranged things he promotes. He writes, we should concentrate on the more terrifying problem. The leader of one of America's two major political parties has just signaled to the Kremlin that if elected, he would not only refuse to defend Europe, but he would gladly support Vladimir Putin during World War III and even encourage him to do as he pleases to America's allies. 
naturally because the Republican Party has been fully consumed by the MAGA movement and completely abandoned any vestige of their old ideology. Trump's comments were defended, dismissed, and legitimized by none other than serial flip-flopper Marco Rubio, senator in name only from Florida. I mean, he was talking about something, a story that he talked about happened in the past. He doesn't talk like a traditional politician. And uh, we've already been through this now. You'd think people had figured it out by now. I have zero concern. Oh, but he does talk like a, a traditional common fascist. But that, okay, that was just one of the many dangerous ideas that Trump promoted during just the past 72 hours. On Friday, he told a room full of gun lovers that he would roll back any gun safety measures Biden has taken while in office. This was after he reminded them that while he was in office, he proudly did nothing about gun violence. He also plans to round up 11 million migrants and force them into detention camps on U.S. soil, let federal officers shoot migrants, and allow police and even the military to shoot protesters on American streets, grant every police officer full immunity to kill at will, gut the EPA and let oil companies drill anywhere they want, teach patriotic education in public schools, Mao Zedong style, ban abortion nationwide, terminate the Constitution, and start a war with Mexico because he wants to betray yet another ally. And those are just a few examples from a very long list of disturbing policy proposals Trump plans to enforce on day one. You know, the day he said he would be a dictator. Joining me now is William Taylor, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and vice president for Russia and Europe for the United States Institute of Peace. And Tom Nichols, the aforementioned staff writer for The Atlantic. And Tom, I am going to start with you because I feel that we've reached the point where the media must di diverge from this plan of equalizing Biden being an old man, which he can't do anything about because time is time and Donald Trump being thoroughly deranged. But I will allow you to talk. You know, it's one thing to cover both candidates in a political race. It's another to cover a candidate from a, a normal political party and uh, a presumptive nominee, um, because he's not the nominee yet, but he's on his way, um, who is literally saying things that, if anyone else said them, would be taken as evidence of severe emotional disorder of some kind. Uh, and that, I think, is, you know, you can't just simply say, well, we're going to cover one candidate and not the other. Um, but the fact that Trump says these things, it, it tells you, and that they're not just uh, covered as widely as they would be if someone else said them, suggests that Trump has just gotten us used to it. He's numbed us to it. He has fire hosed us to it to accept as Senator Rubio shamefully just said, well, you know, it's just the way he talks. He doesn't talk like a normal politician. The problem is that he's aiming all of this, uh, Trump is aiming all of this at a domestic audience because he's terrified of not being elected because then he faces justice in multiple venues. But when he talks, the rest of the world is listening. They're taking notes. They are, they are absolutely uh, um, taking this as an indication of what he would do when he's in office. And so you know, what he's done is not only reckless and irresponsible, it's incredibly dangerous. And to stay with you for just a moment, Tom, I mean, the, Marco Rubio, by the way, who used to call Donald Trump dangerous when he was running against him in 2016, and he still, I believe, believes that. He's just saying whatever at this point, like the rest of the cowards, right, in the party. The, the way that people get away with saying Trump's not so bad is they're like, well, he already served. He was already president, and he didn't do X, Y, or Z. But can you just speak to the further degradation of the dignity and spines of Republicans? Because I can't think of any who would stop him if he decided to pull out of NATO this time. They're more cowardly than they were before. They're more cowed and they're more focused because they're like, when he gets in, we can get rid of Medicare. We can privatize Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security. So we don't care what he does. Do, can you name two of them who'd stop him if he said he was getting out of NATO? Because I can't. No, and it's utterly fallacious to say, well, because he didn't do this the first time around, he won't do it the second time around. Uh, there were a lot of reasons he didn't do these things the first time around, in part um, because he didn't know how to, and the people hmm. around him didn't know how to, um, and because there still were responsible people around him who were simply not going to go along with these kinds of um, harebrained schemes. 
Um, this time around, there won't be anybody to stop him. And as we, as you point out, as we just saw, um, what Republican politicians, what elected Republican politicians want to do is keep their jobs and stay in Washington, because the only people they fear as much as Donald Trump are their own constituents. They don't want to go home. They don't want to be around the people that elected them. And that means they'll do anything to stay in Washington. If that means um, agreeing with Donald Trump when he threatens to destabilize the, the, the peace and security of the entire planet, well, you know, so be it. That That's how you get to stay in Washington, I guess. Correct. Uh, they think that they'll survive it. They'll figure they'll be okay. They've got money. And back